Okay, everyone, it's four o'clock. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Angela Smith. I am the founder and creative director of Pearl and Loop. And we have here um, our two co-hosts today, uh, Liz Gibson of Yarn Worker, um, who is the inspiration for this uh, collaboration, which resulted in the Swatchmaker 3-in-1. And we have Marcella Soto here also, and she's gonna be managing the chat. And um, she's uh, gonna help make sure this video gets edited as, as good as it can be, and we'll make it available. Um, probably real close to where you guys uh, signed up for this. And then once that video is ready, we'll let Liz know and she'll make sure to let you all know and we'll send out emails and whatnot. So everyone, what you see on the screen is what's gonna be in the video. So if y'all um, don't want your face, photo, name, whatever, just um, go ahead and hide that. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so I've told you a little bit um, about Liz and, and Marcella. Marcella, actually, I know her sister, and that's how I met Marcella, and she's in Colombia, and she handles um, the postings for us, for our social media. So when you guys watch us on Instagram or Facebook, it's usually I'm the one who's taking the photo and um, maybe crafting the caption, um, but Marcella's the one who places it in the calendar and um, schedules it all out and does the kind of more tedious stuff that I don't like. Um, and also let you all know that we had, so I've got this, everyone's order number here. We are going to do a drawing for this small, the newest Swatchmaker product. It's the small Swatchmaker 3-in-1. And um, at the end, you know, I'll kind of just randomly touch on a number and then we'll see who, who that order number belonged to. Um, the only requirement is that you had to have been on, in this meeting. You don't, if you have to sign off, you know, if, if it's Susie Jones and you, you have to go because we know how life happens, just make a note of it in the chat. And so that way, um, you know, Marcella, if I call, call your name out, Marcella can let me know if that was, that was you. Um, and then we're going to um, give away one of these. So that's, that's what's going to happen today. And um, we will, uh, I'll be, we have an agenda here. We are going to talk about um, how to use the three different warp options, uh, setting up, getting started, and using the tools, um, types of yarn that's compatible with uh, the various warp options, how to manage threading holes when you're dealing with super long warp yarn, um, how to change color and weave in your ends, removing from the loom, uh, both when you're wrapping around the prongs and dealing with the holes, and we also have this alternative method that I, I demoed real quick last month um, of how you can warp the holes and not have to wrap it around the back. And then we'll uh, have some Q&A with Liz and then we'll do the drawing. Uh, throughout this, Liz um, and Marcella may jump in, like if there's a question, they'll jump in while I'm demoing and might ask or Liz might add some technical expertise. Um, my expertise, I'm really all about the manufacturing and um, I'm very self-taught in the weaving world. So I don't, I can't always answer your technical questions. So just know that um, you can make a chat with it or, um, and then we'll do our best to answer throughout this session. So here we go, I'm gonna change the screen and get started. Okay. So, so we have the Swatchmaker three in one and it's called the three in one because you have three warping options. You've got the top row, it's eight, pro, eight ends per inch or an eight set. The middle row is 10 and the bottom is 12. So we're going to show you and I've Pardon my cat, who's very, very noisy. I'm going to show you how to, how to warp this up. So 
So we're going to do a section on the prongs. And this would be like a no fringe setup. So I use tape. Got my prong here. Go down to the bottom. Then I wrap it around like that. Bring it up to the next prong. Wrap it around again. Like that. And the yarn that I'm using here is from Just Yarn Company, and it's called um, Duet. It is really one of my favorite yarns. I've got to be careful. Um, watch when you're doing this so it doesn't catch like it just did there. And I have really liked working with this Just, just Yarn. It's a linen and cotton blend. Stop there. All right, so that's warping the prongs. If you wanted to, you could wrap it around the back, but um, I'll show you how we do the, do set up the next row, which is how, the same way we did this row, where it's wrapped all around the back. Also, I'm gonna cover how, um, what to do, like if you've got a lot of yarn and it, you're warping it through the holes, it's getting tangled, and how you can, uh, how I break that apart and, uh, and then connect it and keep warping. So we'll start here. Uh, there we go. So when you buy the Swatchmaker 3-in-1, it'll come with a needle that um, will fit through these uh, holes. So I'm gonna tape it secure. And I just marked it ahead of time uh, the hole I'm going to go into, I count from the edge if I'm not using my whole warping up the entire loom. Okay, and then I wrap it around the back and come up to the next one. Come back down. up. Okay, so go through here. So for me, it always gets tangled. So I just like to work with shorter pieces. And then what I do is because when I take it off the loom, I'm going to cut in the middle you know, or, or close to the middle. So I will ideally be a little bit further up, but I'll just connect another set of yarn, knot it, because this won't really matter when you, when you cut off the loom. And then I'll continue warping. So y'all have to tell you when um, when Liz and I 
when Liz called me about this years ago in August of 2015, I think it was, um, and she was telling me what she was looking for, what, what her problem was, it took about 20, 30 minutes of talking when all of a sudden I could envision all these holes and, and how we could set up this, um, this little loom that would give you three options. And um, we were in, the Houston, in Houston at that time and we were able to prototype something probably I think within a couple of weeks and um, play around with it and then um, eventually perfect it. And it was available for sale in um, January of 2016. Okay. All right. There's an example of uh, warping it in that section. And um, later on, we're going to demo. Um, I have various sample set up where we demo taking it off the loom when with when it's wrapped around the prongs and and then demo taking it off the loom when we wrap it front to back and here I did a connection so I'll show you how we handle that and then this is an example of um, I'll show you how to do the alternative um, setup and then I will take this off the loom so you'll see how um, that works as well. Okay. Are there any questions right now that I can answer or Liz that Liz can answer? You can unmute yourself if you want to talk or if you see the chat. We have a comment from Kate. She says um, she secures the yarn on the back with blue painter's tape because it doesn't leave the residue and it's easy to see and lift off. Yes, I could, I could, that, that would be a good idea. I use uh, the masking tape, but sometimes it doesn't, it does it, if, um, cause we apply like an oil to this to condition the wood and sometimes the masking tape uh, doesn't adhere very well. So I could see where the blue tape would work really well. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. Uh, my name's Sue. And um, I noticed that you're wrapping it all the way around in a continuous deal. And um, I don't, trying to figure out if there's anything wrong, what I started doing, frankly, just to save on yarn, instead of it wrapping all the way around, but going in one hole and then coming out the hole right next to it and going down. In other words, just going from hole to hole on the front and not wrapping it all the way around. Is there a reason why that would, wouldn't work? I'll just take that one for a minute. Um, there's no reason that it won't work unless you want to preserve the set, right? So part of the goal of this tool is that we want a certain number of sets per inch. So if you do that, then you alter the spacing. So it depends on what you're making and what Angela is going to show later is a method where you can use the holes and still not have to wrap around. Right. I tend to, to wrap around even though it, it uses up a little yarn because as I'll talk about later, I use it for sampling and in weaving fringe happens. Like we don't always have the option not to have fringe. So I like to have it so I can play around with it. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the benefit of it is of wrapping it all the way around is to get the fringe is what you're saying. Correct. The okay. bet, yeah. So, um, for folks who want to make things like if you're making a bracelet or you're actually using it where you don't want fringe you have that option on a frame loom which you don't have on a rigid heddle or table loom or floor loom oh, i understand what you're saying okay thank you okay all right um, I'm now going to show you how to get started on the loom and we're going to uh, you know, get started and change colors. We're going to work with the weaving shuttle, um, our metal weaving needle. Uh, we've got um, we, using the, the comb and in this example, I'm going to do two pickup sticks and you'll see why in a minute. And also I um, want to point out we have this little tool like if you wanted to see what your warp would look like. 
um, you have a tool, we have this tool called a set checker and you can wrap it and you can see how many ends per inch when it's spaced at eight and then 10 and 12. So you can see the difference there. So we have um, one that says heddles up and then um, we've got this yarn worker one and I'm, I have to say I'm really proud of the yarn worker one because I finally figured out this laser machine that I'm using here in Tulsa how to get it really good looking. So um, those tools help you kind of figure out what it's going to look like. So you can see it here and this is the same yarn and it's pretty similar. So um, every loom comes with a wood tapestry needle and I'm looking for one as an example and I misplaced it somewhere around here but there's always a wood oh here it is a wood tapestry needle and this is solid maple and we bevel it just a little bit right here to make it easier to go over and under we don't do it very much not too intensely but that's something like if you wanted it more rounded, you could take sandpaper and, and sand that. Um, but I personally really like working with the, a metal, um, this weaving needle, and it's a John James, uh, sometimes they're called sacking needles, packing needles. On our site, we call this just a, a metal weaving needle. So um, I'll get started here. So I'm gonna go over, under, and one of the things I have to be really careful about is not splitting my warp yarn. And sometimes um, I do that and then it, it's, it's problematic when I'm taking it off the loom. So over, under. So I'm not gonna use the shuttle just yet, but um, when we change colors, we'll uh, do the shuttle there. So I've gone over, under, I pull it through and um, sometimes when I'm, uh, if you, if I pull it through, like right here, it looks like it's, it's it looks great, right? Um, but I like to see, I think all the yarn always has just a little bit of tension and that tension will build up as you go up the, the project, up the loom. So I just loosen it a, a teeny bit. Then I've got this tail here and I don't like weaving the tails in at the end. So recently I've started doing this new technique and I actually think it's because I saw, saw something on Liz's um, site about it. But what I do now is I take my little tapestry, this is a thicker, bigger tapestry needle that also comes with the loom. And I go um, the opposite. So if I went over, I'm going under, over, under, and I go about eh, halfway, depending on, you know, how wide the project is. I beat it down. And I just, I just leave this here for the moment. I'll cut it later. And on the, I have examples too on the pieces that we're going to take off the loom in a little bit where I've done the same thing. So now I'm, I, I want to go back, but when you get the accessories, you get a pickup stick and when the neat, the pickup stick is like a placeholder. So in my case, I'm right-handed, so I don't mind going over and under on the right side, but coming back on the left, it's just not as um, easy and simple for me. What does it mean that you lose the set? I'm not sure. Um, is that a question in reference to the previous answer? Is the question what is set or um, how you have the spacing? Um, so I'm not sure if I understand what the question is and referring to. I'm going to make a guess. And you can clarify here, Monique. Um, that set is the spacing of the yarn. So in weaving, we have how many ends you have per inch. And um, if you alter the way that you thread the loom, then um, you'll change the set and may or may not get the results that you're looking for depending on the weft yarn you're using. May or may not be that big of a deal just depending on how you're using the loom and what you're losing it for. So it's kind of a weaver's jargon. 
Um, but that may not have been, what does it mean that you lose a uh, reference? Oh yeah. So my understand, so that's, I was right. My understanding when, um, and I lost the chat, the previous question was saying, you know, you can just go in one hole and around the back and come out the other hole. The only danger with that is if you notice how the holes are staggered, so you have one on the top and one on the bottom, that's because um, you're maintaining the set. So as long as you're maintaining the yarns going in each hole, you're fine. Where you can get into trouble is say if you skip one because of how you're wrapping around. So um, it's doable. Um, and the challenge with doing that as well is when it comes to taking it off the loom. Because if you thread behind the hole and you go to cut, you have these itty bitty tiny ends. So if you haven't secured it on the loom on either side, that can also give you some trouble, which is something I didn't mention earlier. So um, does that answer your question? It was kind of two in one. So you just want to make sure you're maintaining the spacing and not skipping any holes. And you want to be mindful about not uh, either finishing on the loom with some stitching or leaving yourself or do it in a way that you can take it off the loom and there's no fringe or having fringe so you can finish it. Um, yes, absolutely. That's what you can hem stitch before cutting and then you'll be fine. Okay, I think I got it back. <laughs> Good. Oh, Y'all, so sorry. <laughs> my, uh, my computer, if something kept popping up and I was afraid it was going to show up on, on your, your screen and I messed it all up. Um, so, woo, okay, anyway. Um, so I use this pickup stick as a, as a placeholder and I use it going from left to right. So in this case, and I have to like ignore this little spot here. Um, I pretend I don't see that and I go um, under over because I'm matching it. I'm doing the opposite of what I was doing here. Okay, so this was over, so I'm going to go under or over. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this here for the, for the remainder of my project. Um, and then what I do is I lift it up. You see I'm creating this space. Now I'm just gonna take my needle and go all the way through and I don't have to go pick up each uh, warp yarn. Oops, I lost one of my things there. Okay, all set. Okay, so and I go back down and it's kind of, it, it doesn't have much tension in it because I, I went up at an angle and then I um, use this weaving comb to pack it back down. And as you keep weaving this tail, it'll get more secure in there. So I don't worry about it slipping out. And like I said, I'll cut it later at the end. And then I go back and now I have to pick up each little um, warp yarn because my pickup stick is only working for one direction. Yes, so um, you can use the pickup stick as a beater, which is, um, Angela's using the comb. I like to use the beater um, because it helps me align it as well. A lot of the work that Angela does is a little more weft based, but if you're wanting a more balanced weave, then you could um, slide, as she has that pickup stick, you could slide it down. Do you wanna do that on this turn, Angela? So instead of using your comb, Pull the pickup stick so it's what's pressing the yarn into place. Yeah, like exactly. So you can use that as a beater too. And sometimes that helps you when you're doing a more balanced weave. But as um, Angela's demonstrating with the comb, she's doing a little more weft face. So that's where some of the, depending on what you want your picks per inch to be, would come into play. Okay, we're going to do one more row. 
and then we'll switch colors and work with the shuttle. Okay, so how I've been doing this, this is just lately in the past couple of months, so I know I'm, I'm gonna change colors, get my tapestry needle again. And then I just weave it in. Like this. Pull it out in front. And I do the comb because I, I tend not to like um, I like it not, I don't really care to see the, um, the warp yarn as much. So it's just my, my weaving style. Um, so I tend to pack it down a little bit tighter. Okay. So now we're going to work with the shuttle. So I've got my yarn, the shuttle, and clearly if you're trying to go over under with the shuttle, it's going to get all, you know, caught. Uh, with your yarn and on your warp. So in this case, you use a pickup stick again, a second pickup stick. And so we also bevel these a little bit. Um, sometimes they're a little thinner than others, but you can always do the same with a piece of sandpaper yourself too. And um, I, let's see, I'm gonna create a space for my shuttle. So oh sorry. So I've got this. I came through that way. So I go here, open it up. And using the shuttle just helps you not have to deal with pulling all that yarn through. My little needle. Weave in the end. Okay. So now I'm going to come back. All right. So I'm going to move this up here. And so since I was under here, I'd go over. And my pickup stick is going to create the space for my shuttle to go through. Audrey's asking if you could use a ply split join, which is something, um, hello, Audrey. <laughs> yes, you bet. So there are any of your favorite ways for those of you who are uh, weavers already, um, you can use whatever is your favorite tail incorporating technique. So you could use a ply split join, um, feathering, uh, lots of options there. But the tail tuck is the sort of uh, easiest, most expedient. And I'm a beginner weaver. Uh, the sample, any of the photos you see are usually taken by me. Uh, I made the sample but I don't weave that, that much. So I try to, when I do, I, I want it to be kind of quick. Well, okay, so this one, I'm, I'm gonna take my stick out. The stick always remains in there. And then go back through again. And then I would repeat the process and do, and do that. Um, over and over. Are there any questions about that? Getting started and using your pickup stick and um, the shuttle? Uh, uh, <laughs> my name is Sue, but um, I'm not quite understanding when you come back with a second pickup stick, are you doing, I can't tell from looking at it, but are you doing like a pickup stick pattern there? Or no, no, I'm, so normally I would, if, if this was on the needle, the yarn was on the needle. So like I said, I have it, this pickup stick set up so that when it comes out this back over here, I just slide my needle through here, right? Okay. And so. then normally when I'm working with the needle, I then would, so see here I'm under, 
So I'd have to pick up each warp yarn, right? Right. To get to to um, weave it through. Okay. And I, if I can chime in for just a minute, the, the main benefit of what she's doing with a two stick is to create a bigger shed. So the shed is the opening or the spacing that she's created and that makes it easier to get the sh past the shuttle through. So I understand, so okay. Yeah, um, and it's good yeah, to pick yeah. up pattern, but yeah. that's not what she's doing here. So, enough space. so it, it's still, but the same process, you're gonna put that stick in every time, just like you're doing with the needle, correct? Correct. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, if, you, if there are no other questions, I'm going to move on to, let me look at my list here. Um, we can t I'll go over um, compatible yarn for each warp, and then I'll go over removing it from the loom, if that works for, um, for everyone. Unless, Liz, you think we should do it opposite. Oops, sorry, I was answering Audrey's question, which is, yes, you could definitely carry it up the side. <laughs> Okay, so um, here's some examples of the different sets and some of the yarns that uh, we work with, that you might work with. These are just suggestions and they're just things um, <clears throat> that uh, yarns or threads that I had here. So in this case, in the eight, the eight EPI, I am, um, Oops, got my little list somewhere. Okay. I worked, um, this is an Erica Knight British blue wool yarn. And um, this is Blue Sky Fibers wool stock. And I'm using for my warp just duet. They're, they're cotton linen duet, and that's for each one of these. And in this example here, I'm using just yarn duet. So you can see how like it's packed. You don't, you don't see the warp very much, but that's also my weaving style. And um, up here, I'm using some Sue Spargo Eleganza um, three weight. So uh, that's like her thickest cotton uh, yarn when um, or thread and I like that like when I'm working with the bracelet loom because the wool itches my wrist so I really I like to work with um, cotton when I can and then this is Kobasi DK by Haiku which is distributed by Scassell this one right here so that's some examples of types of yarn thread you can work with on the on the eight set and then over here um, I'm, this is the 10. I'm using Erica Knight again, Studio Linen. And uh, so it's a bit thicker and it, you see a lot more of the weft yarn uh, here. And then I'm using some Weeks Dye Works Pearl Cotton, which is more of an embroidery thread here. And here I'm using Duet. This one is different on the 10 set. You notice there's more spacing. I didn't work real hard to pack it down because I was afraid it would it would distort my piece. So it's a bit of a looser weave. And um, here's a. I'm going to more... chime in for just a minute just to say there's a question about how big of a sample you need to do to get um, a true sample of the final results. And um, that's one of the questions I was going to have in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll just briefly talk about that here. So in terms of, well, actually, maybe if we table that for just a minute when we get to the Q&A and N, because I'll talk a little bit about my process and how I use the Swatchmaker Loom as a sample loom. And we'll just let um, Angela finish with sort of yarn selections on the set. And then I think we have the whole process coming up. Is that... That's correct. Sort of for the uh, demonstration portion? Yes. Yeah. So maybe if we can table that for just a minute until we get to the um, q and I'll give you a little more extended answer. Okay. Um, so I'll go through this real quick. Um, this is also, I hear I'm using uh, Valdani 
um, Kroll, let's see, it's, um, it's a Valdani thread. It's like a wool thread that like I picked up at, at Quilt Market. And um, then I go over here to the 12 and I did another example of um, duet on a 12 set. So a little bit harder to see, but it's a little bit challenging depending on your weave style. You know, like you can see it's definitely different from the eight, to the 10 and the 12. This is more, um, this is Weeks uh, Cruel Wool, which really seems to like, if per, per my weaving style, likes this um, Duet Warp Yarn and um, the 12 set. It just, it just wove really good. And this is a Zilana um, Cashmere and Brush Tail Possum yarn, a real fine, uh, lace weight yarn that I had lying around. Um, I like working with really nice yarns when I'm weaving because if I'm gonna spend that kind of time on the project, I want the yarns to feel really good. And um, this is more, some more Sue Spargo, but it's a five weight cotton. Whereas this one was the three weight, it's a thicker one. This is um, the next level of, of thin. And then this is another example of the Valdani Cruel Wool. So those are just um, some examples of types of yarns, um, like especially for someone who's a beginner, you might have some stash of threads or yarn lying around and how it might, it might work with um, each type of yarn on a different set. Any questions? Okay. So I'll go through on this, the alternative warping before I start showing you how I take each each piece off the um, the loom with the different types of, of warp. And this example, I already have um, I already have a piece sample woven up right here, and we're going to talk about how to warp using the prongs and the holes and not wrapping it all the way around the back so you don't have as much yarn waste. So I'm gonna start, let's see, over here. Oops, went a little too, got a little too carried away. And just to clarify, the method that Angela is showing you here, which is, and she's going to show you the next step when she takes it off the loom, is not only how to not use as much yarn, but you can actually take it off the loom and finish it without having to hem stitch ahead of time and have a seamless, uh, have no fringe and be finished. So it may seem a little different. I, I might have uh, than the whole thing we were talking about yesterday. That either clears things up or makes it more complicated. <laughs> This is just something that I thought of in my head. I mean, it took like what we started this Liz in 2016 and I just kind of solved this what last month. Okay, so I've got it here. You know, and I'll ignore my little labels. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell what's wrong with these looms and we have to make sure they don't get into circulation. Um, so we put a label on them when we have a little issue. Okay, so it's come out the back, right? And I wrap it around a prong. It doesn't matter what prong you use, you know, because you've got 12, you have 12 per inch here and you only have eight here. So sometimes if you were to do this whole piece, you're going to have to double up. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go all the way across, but I'll just pick a prong. And I'll show you when we take it off the loom, I'll show you why it doesn't matter. So I wrap it around the prong like this. So you see it here. And I'm going to go back into the hole it came from. Okay. So when I first experimented, I would do this and then I would come over to this hole and come through, but then that meant when I'm trying to take it off, it was catching, it, it was behind here and I don't want anything 
securing it from the back. I want it all in the front. So then I come through here, but well, you know, look, I'm still here. I gotta get over there to the next one. So then I go into the next one. Okay, so see, see this little part here? I want everything in the front so when I, I can lift it off. This, when I, the first time I tried it, this was in the back. Now I'm gonna go around the prong again. And I'm going to come back through the hole I went in. Okay. And then now it's ready to go to the next one down here. In this example, this thread, I'm actually using a thread, embroidery thread from Sue Spargo, an eight weight, just so you could see it and it would be smooth. Um, but I normally would not warp uh, with that, this thread. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back, wrap it around the prong, come back in the hole I came through. All right. Now I'm going to go to the next, I'm going to go to the next hole. Wrap it around. Do it over because I lost my hold. Ah. Okay, now I'm going to come back down to the next hole. Come. And this is where you're going to be happy to have a recording. And again, the real uh, magic for this will come when Angela shows the next step of uh, a fringeless finish. And I've already got a piece warped up right next to it to show how it comes off. Okay. And when I'm, I'll stop now, but when I'm done, I just go through here. And I would cut it. and tape it just to secure it. Okay. So you can see here, let me take this off so it's not so distracting. <laughs> you can see here how I did that with these. So it, you know, here you can see where it's going at an angle and that's not gonna matter when you take it off. Um, and same here. Now in this example, I am warping with a, um, rayon embroidery thread from Sue Spargo. And the only reason I'm warping with this thread is I don't wanna embarrass myself when I try to take it off and if I accidentally split the, the warp yarn and it, then it doesn't work. Um, working with um, rayon is a little, it, it's a little loosey goosey. So I don't really recommend it. Um, it doesn't 
cooperate as easily as this uh, the wool does um, or cotton but in this case it is real silky and slick and smooth so it doesn't catch so now um, what I experimented with the last time we did this we took it all off and it was kind of um, a bunch of little loops that looked a little unmanageable since then I've practiced doing it the way I'll show you how to take it off fringeless. And this will be the, pretty much the same technique. But I pick a spot in the middle. So it doesn't really matter where, but generally in the middle, I'm going to take it off. Okay. Now I'm going to pull it through. Okay, so I've got this long loop, right? Now I'm going to guesstimate where it might connect on the other side. And I'm doing this this way because I feel like I have more control with all the other warp threads still on, on the loom. So this didn't quite come out. So I think it's connected over here. So there we go. Okay. So now I've got two loops. Okay. And I think that this bottom is this one's top. I'm going to double check. Yes. I go see how that goes. Okay, now I'm going to, actually I want to go down, I want to go this way, so I'm going to take this top, I'm going to put my finger there to kind of secure it, and I'm going to pull gently. You want to go really gently because if you pull too hard and it's tight, it's really hard to get it back out without, to loosen it without getting a bit messy. Okay, so now no loop there, but lots of loop here. So now I'm going to come to this other end, take this one out. And now I've got another loop. So since I pulled the top here, when I pull the top here, it's going to be this one's bottom. Okay, now long, long loop. Okay. They're liking it. <laughs> oh, good. It's really great when you're doing, the, well, for all kinds of reasons, but some of the cute projects that Angela has on the website, like the bracelets and the coasters and things where you just uh, don't want fringe, you want something really clean. Um, you can use this in all sorts of ways. I have to confess, I did practice this, so I wouldn't embarrass myself with y'all here. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'll go up. I, I do it in the middle and go down because I just don't want to pull this really long thread all throughout my entire piece. So I kind of split it up. Now I'm going to go from the top. And maybe I'll just take the opportunity to jump in so you all can see how it's working because um, I know it's about 10 till and I don't have anywhere to go. So no worries, but I know some folks might um, and answer the previous question in terms of 
um, tell you a little bit how I use the swatch maker and why the three in one was important to me. Some of you know this story and I also want to to give a shout out to folks in the room who are brand new weavers and a lot of jargon or things that come your way. So um, feel free to ask questions for the, the seasoned weavers in the room. Um, I really needed a way to check my sets. Um, so the set checker helps because I can visualize them. I'm a rigid heddle weaver and I primarily work in the sets of eight, 10 or 12. Um, that's why we have those sets on there. You can also double up, right? You can use more than one in and get a set of 16, 20, 24. And so depending on what I'm doing, if I'm, oh, there she goes. She's got it. <laughs> there you go. No fringe. I would cut it and then I would just weave this in. And that is, that is it to do that. Awesome. Um, this is exactly how I would take it off the loom here. I would just pull it off. So to save time, I won't do that. I could always do it at the end, you know, after we do the drawing and if people still want me to show them how I take it off here, but it's the same thing. I took out the, the prongs and I pulled it and, um, that, that's definitely an option. Like Liz, I, I can still be here um, after five. Um, and this is an example of taking it off with the fringe. And in this case, I'm just going to say here, I used um, do, do uh, just yarn again and their new mallow. I wanted to play with it. It's cottony and it's cotton, not cottony, and it's got some slub. So there's a different texture. Um, and then take it up. Take the tape off. And then you just, I'm not going to tie off the ends, uh, you know, to finish it completely, but I'll show you how we get it off. Cut it about halfway through. Okay, I just didn't want that knot to get caught in the hole here. And then you just lift it up. And then I think everyone has different styles for finishing their fringe. Uh, I tend to just, I, like I said before, I go really, really simple. And I just tie it. And then I'll do it again. And I'll do that throughout till I finish and then I'll cut it at the end. Um, so it's like a uniform length. So that's how you can do it with fringe and without. And we can move on if anyone has questions or Liz will probably answer them. So we can move on to uh, Liz and questions you might have for Liz. All right, I'll answer the one I tabled, which is how big of a swatch do you have to do? I wanted this, the, the swatch maker three in one because often I'm on the fence between sets, right? Do I want an eight or a 10? Do I want a 10 or a 12? And so I would warp up as you would see what Angela's doing two uh, sets right next to each other and weave them. I want at least um, two inches is good for me to kind of get an idea of how the set's gonna work. So this is a spongy yarn. These are two set examples I used. Um, and then I can kind of see how it's working. Now, like knitting, you're gonna get your best information if you have at least a four inch square piece of fabric. So something that looks more like this, right? Because that's going to tell you a lot more. Um, it's going to give you more accurate information. That said, um, you know, I'm trying to work fast. Part of it is I like to say I was trying to fail faster. So I can get a good idea if I'm on the right track by doing something as small as two inches in those little strips. And then I'll iterate. So um, for instance, I've shared this, it's one, it's a sample that's in the book. I did a little couple of pickup pieces. In this case, I was picking up a pattern. Um, I was trying out some yarn. I only, the, 
The yarn company only sent me one skein of each, so I had to make a project and figure out all the swatching. So I was really being conservative with my yarn. I wanted the fringe. I finished it in different places. I wasn't kind of getting, actually, I think this was my first one. And then I was getting to a different place. So I did a couple of swatches and then it ended up being um, this project. So I could get kind of comfortable with what it was I was trying to do, how to finish it, what I was working up and could go to this step. If I'm sampling for color, right, or um, other things, I do like that four inch square set. So I, there's, there's swatching for set and trying to decide what I'm doing and then there's swatching for color as well. Um, so I have a couple of examples and I do need to mention we have a monsoon rolling in here in New Mexico. So uh, sometimes my upload speeds go kapooey for those of you who have hung out. So sometimes um, here's where I was doing a little color study. Um, so I got it on a sort of more generous sized swatch. And as um, you can, yeah, at least, so you can definitely do a pickup pattern. The challenge is one, you either have to know how to read the fabric um, or read a draft if it's included. Now, a lot of pickup patterns, um, you have to kind of build your own draft or understand how to pick up those sequences. And I do have a blog post on the Yarn Worker site. So if you go to yarnworker.com, use the search button and um, search for swatching, there'll be a blog post that'll come up with some tips about how to swatch for structures other than plain weave. Um, the trick is you have to know kind of how to pick up those patterns, right? How to read them. And um, if you're a, a floor loom weaver, you just work off the draft. If you know how, and sometimes you have to create a drawdown, right? So that you have that graph that you can work from. It's a really fun exercise in general to, um, if you're just curious about getting to know drafts better, learning how to do a drawdown and um, pick it up is really fun. We've done that in a couple of weave alongs and um, there's a lot of design power in that. Um, when you do the four inch, can you warp only halfway up? Um, so Audrey, are you saying, uh, so I would warp narrower, I could warp the whole thing or I could warp narrower and then I can weave just as far as I want to get a square, right? So there are two styles of loom. We were focusing on the three and one because the techniques there, um, it covers all the techniques and it's where we have the most questions. We definitely have the other style of loom that's just slots. Um, I'm gonna have an old one. This is the acrylic that we used to have. So they do come with, um, they're in a slightly smaller size. So this warps up a four inch and they have just the slots so you don't have holes, but they're three separate looms. What do I search for to get the pickup stick pattern? Oh, that was privately directly to me, Sue, but I'll answer. If you just go in and to the search and look for swatching, it should come up um, how to swatch a blog post, how to swatch structures other than plain weave. And if you can't find it, of course I should, um, jump in and add the link, which I'll do here in a minute. Um, you can also always email me at worker at yarnworker.com and I'll be happy to send you the link. Hey Liz, um, here's a, here's a, the, the new maple. Oh, yay. The, these are the individual swatch makers. So y'all, we have transitioned into using solid maple for a variety of reasons. And uh, we still have the birch ones of, available, but once they're gone, they're gone. Um, but this is the, we were totally out of the eight set um, in birch. So this is the maple one. We have some, um, they're being glued by Hector right now that say yarn, they have the yarn worker logo on them. And then we have a couple of sets of three um, available as well with the yarn worker logo. So this is just what, what Liz was talking about, the individual loom with no holes. And Annette's asking, is there a way to do the hem stitch trick on the eight set of loops? Yes. So that technique that she was showing with using no fringe, you can use on the, the slots, as I like to call them, or the prongs. Um, it works exactly the same way. You want to slide them off 
any, any of the sets. And if you want to do it on the holes, then you have to use sort of a little modified pattern so that it doesn't get caught on the holes. But that will work on um, any of the sets. And there's a, a spec question. Is there a difference in weight in the birch and maple looms? Is um, one heavier than the other? Let's see. Um, no, there, there is, it's, it's minimal. Yeah, uh, I marginal. No. Uh, whoops, sorry, sorry folks. I am just very technically challenged today. Um, it's like patting your head and rubbing your tummy when you have to teach. And <laughs> yeah, I was trying to get, I was trying to put <laughs> my face on there, but I'm going to stop while I'm ahead. Um, no, it's, I think it's a matter of fractional, fraction of an ounce, if there is. Uh, the maple's really lightweight, and uh, it's just, I think it's a little bit lighter weight slightly than the birch. So I don't, I don't think that would be a concern unless you had extremely sensitive, you're very sensitive to the weight. And if that's the case, um, you can uh, just email me directly and I'll weigh it for certain, but I feel like this is like 3.7 ounces or something like that. And that is the cool new smaller version of the three in one. So it just gives you a more like a, a four inch finish square instead of a um, five inch. I think it's like five and a half for the larger size. Yeah, it's just more, it's just, I like palm size cuteness. Yeah, so it's a little bit bigger than our reweaver, but it gives you these options. And uh, it, um, you know, since we transitioned and moved our studio from Houston to Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, we've been able to change how we, how we can do some design work and how we can test it. So it gave us the flexibility to try different, different sizes, taking what people really liked and making it in different sizes. And I, I would look in the chat to see if there are questions, y'all, but I've not had a good luck today when I maneuvered anything around the screen. We'll, so. we'll keep you up to date. Okay. <laughs> are there more? Um, I know folks are interested in the drawing. We're okay. not in a hurry. So um, please, if you, any questions that pop into your head, if you're, please don't be shy because usually somebody else is thinking the same question. Uh, tapestry, is that, can you weave a tapestry? on a loom, I'm assuming. And the answer is yes. And um, the, so tapestry is a wet face weave, right? Where we're, we're beating everything over and then technically tapestry is a discontinuous weft structure, um, teachery here, where you would build shapes. Um, it's technically what a tapestry is. So sometimes to get the shaping right and the beat, you need a ton of tension, right? So the limitation is only going to be how complicated or how precise you want to make your shaping. For simple um, structures, uh, a lot of triangles and simple squares, and you're good. So um, I, li I like to say, because I get that question for Rigid Heddle too, and what I say is you can use all the tapestry techniques on any loom. It's a matter of how... Um, precise you're trying to get with your drawing on wool, drawing with wool or yarn. Where's a good place for me to start weaving? Are you interested in, um, tell me a little bit about your goals. What I love about the Swatchmaker Loom and when I teach out and about often with swatching is that just starting with this little frame loom is a great way to get to know the technology, I mean, to get to know the terminology, um, you know, what's a warp, what's a weft, how the yarns work. And um, I do have a, a free class at the Yarn Worker School. So I also can say it's an opportunity for me to say I have an online weaving school. And there's a free class called uh, Why This Loom? And um, it's free. And so I talk about, I make the case for the rigid huddle loom, but I sort of talk about frame looms and inkle looms and floor looms and you know, rigid heddle looms, which sounds like such a weird name and kind of where their superpowers lie and why I love the rigid heddle loom a lot. Um, so, and what I, so maybe, maybe think about taking why that, why uh, this loom, why that loom. If you go to yarnworkerschool.com, it's a free class right up there at the top that you can 
um, get an idea of where to start. And um, is there a yarn weight limit? No, but the whole question of yarn and in terms of warp and weft is a matter of what your goals are. I, I shouldn't say no. <laughs> you know, yarn is always this vast subject. Um, so you still need a yarn that's safe, it's gonna fit through those holes or is not gonna be too big for what you're using. And I don't know, I use knitting terms a lot because a lot of folks come from the knitting world, but then also people are quilters and have no idea or no, no other makery experience of what yarn weights are. We tend to talk about, um, for balanced weaves, uh, lace, um, in a 12, fingering in a 10, worsted DK in an eight. So those are the kinds of sizes you're looking for. But for instance, oh, bye Catherine, bye Nini. <laughs> um, by, uh, you know, it depends on what you're trying to weave. A wet face weave, right? You That smooth yarn that Angela's doing, you wanna pack it in tight and have it be really open. You want a more balanced weave, which are the kinds of weaves that I'm doing. You want the yarns to kind of be the same size and the set to match. So there's a whole lot of nuancey thing, which um, I see Angela has the uh, Weaver's Guide to Yarn, which is the companion. So I have a short Weaver's Guide to Swatching and a Weaver's Guide to Yarn. They're available on her site. Um, and they just cover a lot of the, some of those basic questions about swatching and about all the yarn things that come up so often. But try, I mean, the beginning is um, play around and see what happens, which is what I love about the little frame looms is they really leave a lot of room for experimentation. And I will say, you know, there's a, there's a lot of technique involved and it may, there may seem like there's right answers, but really what's intuitively works for you is usually a good answer. Yeah, to get started and then you sort of onboard more information as you go. Dash Buster 8. Yeah, so I really liked, the, the reason I approached Angela in the beginning is um, I've been a weaving teacher, I've been a weaver for 30 years and I, I've been teaching weaving um, for almost 20 years now. And there were a lot of frame looms on the market, but most of them, well actually there weren't even that many at the time. Most of them were in a set of six or five and occasionally you would find a set of eight, but there were never looms in a set of 10 or 12. And I could certainly adapt them, right? I could take a four and double it and use sumac and you know, sort of make it work. But for the kind of quick experimentation, I really approached her as a personal project because I was writing Handwoven Home and um, I just didn't have the tools I needed to do the design work. I was having, even on a rigid pedal loom, which is fast, I was having to kind of warp up, use all this yarn, get these big, you know, swatches going and I just needed something little. So we had met at a conference and I just approached her and said, hey, I have this need. Is there any way, you know, you could do some custom work and then bada bing, before we knew it, we had, um, she was all gung ho and we made a loom. <laughs> Is everyone ready for the drawing? Yay. Okay. All right. So what we can do, um, we've got a small loom with the yarn worker logo. So we're going to, we're going to, do that. That's what the drawing is going to be for. It's going to include accessories. So we have heddles up accessories. We have some, um, the only reason why we don't do accessories with the yarn worker logo is we can't fit the yarn worker logo on the little pickup stick. So we just are consistent. But there is a um, yarn worker logo shuttle now available as of today on our website. We have a few. So anyway, um, and it'll have a little heddles up set checker and a heddles up comb plus the needles and instructions. I do have to warn you, the instructions, um, the yarn indications are for the original size. So you, you will have to adapt um, that. So what I'm gonna do, cause I'm gonna be really, really fair. So I've got all the orders. Everybody who signed up, you had to, you had to order on our website. I'm going to mix this up. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm just going to put my hand on a number and then we'll look at and see if that person's name, if they are, uh, if they attended this Zoom meeting. 
Uh, you don't have to be on here to win. I'll have your address, I'll have everything. Um, but as long as you attended, you have to attend to get this. Okay, so, all right, make sure I wanna be totally fair. Okay, I'm closing my eyes and uh, order 6061. That is Tammy Silvers. Did Tammy attend? Marcella, did, do you know if she uh, attended? I'm checking now. Okay. Um, no, I don't see her. Okay. We'll draw again. Okay. I was in a drawing and um, we did the, the, the last person standing drawing. So you had to watch through going all the, so it was very fun. You were on pins and needles. <laughs> it was very all up. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now I'm going to close my eyes and I'm just, I've got my eyes closed and all right. Boom. Five, nine, six, three. That is Catherine Bernard. Is Catherine here? Um, I don't think so, Angela. I don't see her either. Fine. I didn't tell people we were doing a drawing. <laughs> so, back in the hat. Yep, back in the hat. Okay. Katie's here. Katie says she's here. Um, oh, is that Katie, the first person that we called? Katie Silvers? No. Um, uh, well, Katie says she's here in the chat. Yeah. Maybe she doesn't come up as Katie Silvers. So what's is that? Katie, that turn? Is Katie, that actually verify? Katie? In the chat, it says Katie Bernard. Oh, yes, that's me. Okay, Katie, I think you yes. won. <laughs> All right. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'm like, I recognize the name. <laughs> Let me mark it. Okay, Catherine. We will, um, let me see. Uh, I changed it. Okay, Catherine, we will, um, we will ship this to you. Wonderful, thank you. It'll be the small one. I haven't even told her, I, I think I said we were gonna have it on the website, but um, we've only had one person find it and uh, buy it, so you'll be the second person who gets it. Thanks everyone. I know folks are um, hopping off. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Angela, for hosting us and um, happy to take more questions yeah, if there are other I, things. We, I can stay on. So if anybody has any questions or anything else, we can, we can keep going. Looks like. I guess now that people are dropping, my uh, video will behave. Um, <laughs> so I, I had a question. Do, can you get the pickup sticks separately? Yes. Like, I think my kid only comes with one. And so I was, I was curious. That would be correct. Yes, you can get them, get them separate on our website. It'd be under the tools and accessories and fun stuff. I spy oh. a rigid head all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, ha I have a rigid heddle, <laughs> but it's big, so, or bigger than. So I have a question as well. If you have two pickup sticks on this sample loom, you're gonna put in one to create the shed. Can you use the other one with string to no. create the alternative shed? Well, um, you're, so you're talking about using a heddle rod. And um, I, what I do instead of using two pickup sticks, I actually use a um, a knitting needle and okay. 
a pickup stick. Um, you can also use the, because one of the things to talk, and I just had it in front of me. I haven't had great luck using a heddle rod and string heddles on the loom. And, and part of it is um, the heddle rods work best on looms with really tight tension. Right. right? So with the frame loom. So it, it ended up being more fiddly than the time it would take me okay. to just go ahead and use it. Okay. Um, but you can definitely put in like a, um, a, a double pointed knitting needle if you have one. And the, the benefit of that, I mean, I like using two pickup sticks and you will never be sad to have them, is that when you get to the top, you, you'll run, you won't be able to engage both sticks. So you'll have to take out one and then the needle gives you a little bit more room. And eventually you're gonna have to needle weave in the end if you wanna weave all the way up to the top because right. the sticks will just stop working. But yes, I have tried the heddle rod. Okay. Maybe you'll be smarter than me. <laughs> we'll see. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> so Katie, you have your hand up. Do you oh, have a question? I don't, no. Okay, all right, I'm gonna, okay, there you go. Yeah. Hmm. Anything else? Anybody want to see something new that we just got yesterday that uh, haven't even taken a picture of that's going to be available in a couple of weeks? Uh, Marcella will be posting a new product. Why would we say no? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to put it into a different view. Um, we uh, have circle looms, as y'all know, and out of made of solid maple. And now we just and we're, we just tested this last night. All the warps. We have a nesting circle loom. So this one is just fractionally under 15 inches wide. So these will be made to order, uh, and it's set up so that you can. Um, it tells you where to get started. So, you know, you'll start your yarn here and from the back and you'll pull it. We'll do a session on circle looms and come up to the second slot and then you'll come over to the third slot and go to the fourth and then you'll, you'll go all around the loom. And um, these, it, it would reason why we've never made them bigger before is because uh, they, we couldn't get wood, solid wood that um, was, Let's see, I'm gonna put it, uh, there we go. We couldn't get solid wood that was wide enough, that wide. And um, the laser machine, we used to, on our Houston laser, when we had that, you can see how thick this is. So this is a quarter inch and it is um, solid, uh, not solid, it's MDF with a wood veneer. So that, we've always tried to just work with solid wood or, or wood, not MDF but we couldn't go any bigger because there's not material available that could go this size. So um, we, ex I, I just experiment with that. I've got another color here. So we've got, this is walnut veneer. So this will be an option too. And um, I'm gonna experiment about putting the um, mineral oil on the front because it'll give a really nice rich appearance, but not putting anything on the back so that it's, it's easier to tape your, your, your yarn to that. Um, and uh, we'll experiment with that. And then we got one other color, and this is in honor of Liz. Um, we used to have a acrylic, creamy, translucent, kind of white acrylic swatch maker three in one. But uh, the materials it takes to glue them require ventilation and all sorts of stuff. So I played with a material of white melamine over MDF. Cool. So I wanted to see, so I've got the, uh, when this came to me, I had to, you know, finish it, take it out and do all kinds of stuff. So now I've got, I'm going to try melamine glue and see if um, we can glue easily the mel melamine together. And we, and I don't know, we might have to go with this thickness so that a, a white loom might be thicker but we'll experiment making a white swatch maker loom because for some folks, they like the contrast of the color. Mm -hmm. It helps you see the color a little bit more true on the loom, right? As you're working than the wood. 
Um, so that is awesome. Yes. So it, yeah. Um, the white melamine is just a little like we have a, a few little scorch marks and these are on the back, but there are six looms you get. So, you know, down to this size. And um, so this will be a set of six nesting looms that'll be on our site. And we were talking to somebody yesterday about cotton bags that can, you can hold everything in and uh, it'll be made to order. So you'd have to be willing to wait. Sometimes they can be ready within two weeks. Um, we're, as you can imagine with everything going on, there's some delays with shipping and, um, and acquiring the material. So um, it, you'd have to be patient. And, uh, and then once we know, um, have a good idea about demand, we can potentially have inventory available. So yeah, so that's the new. Oh, uh, what is the Finhead Weave Along? So we have two questions. Are you, were you talking about the weave along that I was mentioning earlier, a tube? Um, so I host quarterly free weave alongs for rigid huddle weavers at the Yarnworker School. And that might've been um, what I was talking about earlier. So we, I tend to pick a project that's aspirational, you know, so like double weave or, you know, uh, the next one we're doing is on wet face color work. So something that we might be a little intimidated to try on our own. Um, and so that's, and then I do have a YouTube channel. So uh, yarn worker. And then folks were asking, what do you do with the circle looms? Do you have any of your cool circle pieces yeah. there? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna switch the video view. Oh, that's what you were talking about all along. So. Uh, um, okay. There. Yeah. So here's an example of, um, okay, so this is the largest one. Now, I've, uh, some people have heard me say before, like when you weave on the circle loom, you weave really, really tight, you almost create, you can create a bowl. Well, I know I didn't weave tight, but I used different weights of yarn and it cooperated all the way to here. But then I used this really kind of, it was an alpaca, but it's really lightweight and it just didn't stand up. So this sample did not work out the way I wanted it to for um, the largest piece, but I wanted these because I wanted something that would sit under my pots, my flower pots. Um, so there's that one. And here's an example of another size I wove. I did this in the car when we had to drive to Houston a couple weeks ago. And um, I did that in the car. I think I wove a little tight and it causes this kind of, it, it makes it kind of a cup a little bit. And I have a few more smaller examples. And you have a free project on your website, right? With the circle loom, the little loom? Yeah. Yeah. We do a, um, we made a cord taco. Uh, there we go. So here's one we used, um, this is the small maple, solid maple loom. It's about five and a quarter inches. And uh, we used Blue Sky Fibers wool stock and we did a tutorial. It's available free for download. Um, and uh, you can make a little cord taco like that. So that was one example. And um, we, with the smaller looms, you could use a lot more threads, you know, like your thread stash or your thicker thread stash. So we, uh, let's see. You have the little bowl, one of the things that she was yeah. talking about, like if you weave real tightly, then it yeah. actually curls up on its own and then you get this cool little bowl shape as Here well. We yeah, those are really fun. Yeah, I, I never tried to weave a bowl, but um, now I'm thinking I want to weave with, you know, like thick wool and tight and see if I can create a little bowl. But and then yeah. do you still have the ones that you sell like as jewelry or, you know, pendants? So some of them, you don't actually take off the loom. Yes, you I do. Leave. And those are really, they're really um, little bits of art and jewelry. There's really small ones, but. Here's an example. 
Yeah. This one was fun working with a copper thread and then like a spiral graph technique. We have a little video on our website about that. So we have these little pendant kits and they'll come with the little chain. Um, and like this is uh, walnut, this is maple, and I believe this is alder wood. But um, again, it's a great way to use up all of your um, thread stash. We have little earring kits too that'll come with little the hardware. And uh, it's just fun to work with, you know, your really nice, um, nicer threads with that. And uh, any other questions? You're on, Monique. Oh, I am. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I am muted. Oh, sorry. No, well, it's, I, no, it's on speaker view. So whenever you like, oh, tap I, or something, suddenly you're in the show. <laughs> I, I did try, you know, when I, when I uh, set this up um, video, I had it set up so that I thought I did um, so that it, you wouldn't have to undo yourself. But I guess I, I had technical issues this week. <laughs> No, no worries. No, I actually have to go. I keep uh, all right. Clock. So, but this was very informative. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. I have one question too. One more. Yeah. Um, the small needle that came with it that you use for the ten and twelve. Well, I lost that. So I, I found another needle that would go through the ten set hole but it won't go through the 12 set hole. So what size needle is that? Or can I just? You can get one, it's a, it's a size 20 tapestry needle um, or size 22 will work. And that will go through the hole of the 12 set. Yeah, the 22 okay. will definitely work. Um, sometimes we use a 22, like when we can't, we run out of the size 20. I like the tapestry uh, because it has a bit of a, uh, not as sharp of an end. Yes. Okay. Uh, the 22 is, it can be a little sharp. I, I think even today I stabbed myself when I was uh, <laughs> <going. Okay. laughs> I was just waiting for the blood to show up on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, y'all, thank you um, for joining us. Liz is in New Mexico, Marcella is in um, Bogota, and I am in Tulsa. This has been fun. It's been, uh, you can look forward to getting the, the video. We'll make it available. Um, I'll make sure Liz has the link and she can share it. And uh, you know, you'll be able to download it and, and watch it um, as often as you want. And uh, and if you have any issues ever with the download, um, the service we use, I think it lets you download like just three times and the link expires. You can always just re um, buy, you know, buy, it's gonna be free, or um, let us know and we can send you the link. It's just that that's a method um, so that I don't have to send everybody an individual email like I had to this week because I didn't link it properly. So I got to send 110 emails <laughs> with the link. So y'all, thanks so much for joining us and, uh, you know, post your projects and pictures on Instagram and uh, tag us. We, and we look forward to seeing y'all again. <laughs>